Brilliant. Thank, thank you very much. So we've, we've heard from a, a neurologist and an epidemiologist, a nurse. Can I ask, are there any cardiologists in the audience? We've got one cardiologist. So some of the smartest people in medicine go into cardiology. It's very challenging. Uh, they save a huge number of lives. They do really important work. And uh, probably second, the smartest people second maybe to the neurologist, even the cardiologist would agree. <laughs> And there aren't many cardiologists here, perhaps, because they spend a lot of time away at conferences learning about all the new tech. And the cardiology conference circuit is quite appealing. So this is, uh, these are the first four <laughs> conferences. You, you kick off in Puerto Vallarta in Mexico, and then you, you go to Maui in Hawaii three weeks later for the arrhythmia update, then on to Big Island, Hawaii, uh, and then, and then in, in, uh, in late Feb, there's some late season powder at uh, Snowbird in Utah. Has anyone here skied the late season powder at Snowbird? No, nor have I, uh, because I'm an infectious diseases doctor. And I do, I do go to conferences. Last year I went to a conference in Hackney, which, uh, which meant I could get home uh, for childcare, which was, which was great. Um, and it, I go every year, actually, and it's, it's a conference made uh, really good by a friend of mine who's a virologist who turns up every year wearing a T-shirt that says, I don't have herpes, but I'm working on it. <laughs> and that... Uh... So, some public health doctors uh, a couple of years ago, from, mainly from Harvard, got together, and I'm not saying they were motivated by jealousy, um, only they would know that, but they decided to ask, what was the cost to human life? of cardiologists going on the conference circuit. And so they, they published a paper. What happens to mortality among patients hospitalized? Yeah, yeah, you, 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 hold on, hold on. Not everyone's got there yet. <laughs> when, when cardiologists are at conferences, high-risk patients with heart failure and cardiac arrest hospitalized in teaching hospitals had lower 30-day mortality <laughs> when admitted during dates of national cardiology meetings. Now, in fact, this is a great outcome for everyone because the public health doctors can be even smugger than they normally are. The cardiologists can ski guilt-free and fewer people die. So it's, it's a win all round. And I, I feel very... I really wasn't expecting a cardiologist here. Cardiologists save a huge number of lives. This kind of glitch in the matrix of medicine exists across all our specialties. And uh, it should force us all, clinicians and patients alike, to question how much harm we do when we do uh, any kind of treatment. And um, I'm, I'm sorry, I feel really bad having singled you out. Um, and we see the same uh, 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 data across doctors' strikes. So um, I, uh, there's a big debate now in medicine about uh, over-treatment, over-diagnosis, there are conferences, journals, and this is a problem that I sort of contribute to on both sides. So in one half of my telly career, I make a children's show where we really encourage children to feel safe and secure in hospital. We celebrate medicine, we celebrate all the amazing people that do it, and we want kids to feel safe. Um, so I kind of contribute a little bit probably to some over-treatment there. But then, and we also um, confuse diarrhea samples with chocolate milk sometimes. So, uh, and th the other end of my broadcasting career, I made um, this, these two series called The Doctor Who Gave Up Drugs. And I want to tell you the story of a patient who I treated as part of that series. She's called Sarah. And, um, but the story uh, doesn't start with Sarah. The story starts in the high Arctic 10 years ago. This is uh, Greenland. And I was on a trip with the BBC. I was, I was one of four presenters. And um, as a tropical med medicine doctor, uh, I found myself with a lot of spare time. So um, I persuaded Chris Packham to teach me photography. And I took some nice pictures of icebergs, mainly. And um, toward the end of the trip, I realized that uh, I really wasn't going to be in this program at all if I didn't contrive a reason to be on camera. So I decided to do... Uh, an experiment next to this iceberg. So just there, you can see that little dot. That's a very large ship that the expedition was based on. So this at the time was one of the largest icebergs in the world, and I decided that we would uh, investigate the mammalian diving reflex, uh, and I would jump in the water with a, with a friend who was also presenting, Andy Talbot. And so we decided to get into the two-degree water. We would jump in and uh, measure our heart rates using these... Um, fancy bra-like uh, ECGs. So, um, and there was, there's a bit of an audience. It's a, it's a, it's a challenging environment to get into the water. Um, but we, we jumped in. I'll just do this. So that's uh, jumping in the water there. It's minus two. And we stayed in 
for a minute. Now, when you jump into minus two degrees Celsius water, um, uh, what happens first is that the nerves in your skin, and I'm conscious I'm saying this with a neurologist <laughs> listening, but you can pick up, you can fact check later. Um, nerves in your skin send very urgent signals to some fairly ancient parts of your brain uh, saying that something very, very bad has happened. And those ancient parts of your brain set off a physiological stress response. So it's an ancient set of uh, physiological and hormonal changes in your body that put you into this state of fight or flight. And it's quite extreme. It's probably the most extreme thing you can do to your body that won't do you any per permanent harm. Your heart rate soars, you gasp, your respiratory rate increases, your clotting cascade will start to be activated, your immune system will upregulate it. You're prepared to deal with a wide range of basic threats. So I got out of the, uh, I got out of the water um, after a minute and got back to the boat, and uh, I, it had been a very frightening experience. This was the picture I drew afterwards. The polar bears were sort of not exactly watching, but they, we knew they were nearby. And underneath the water, I imagined all the creatures of the deep. And it was very frightening. But within 20 minutes of, of getting out of the water, I had the overwhelming sensation that I wanted to get right back in. I felt really elated. I felt that I had survived something. And of course, I had survived quite a severe physiological um, threat. And I felt that feeling of, of calm and happiness and elation for um, about 72 hours afterwards. I felt really great. And I stored that knowledge up and didn't think much of it. On New Year's Day, I'd jump in the sea if I was with friends or at the ponds at Hampstead. But I didn't really think much more about it until I came to film The Doctor Who Gave Up Drugs. And one of the drugs I wanted to investigate, one of the classes of drugs, was antidepressants. Mm. I'm very aware there will be people in this room, I'm sure, who've been helped by antidepre antidepressants. There are almost certainly people on them, and there may be people who've felt that they haven't helped. I'm agnostic about whether or not they work or not. I don't really have a view on that. But I do have a view as a, as a scientist, I'm a scientist at UCL, and as a clinician about the state of the evidence about antidepressants. This is the most recent meta-analysis, a combination of the best available science. It's done by a really good team of scientists and, and doctors based at Oxford. Um, and they compared uh, efficacy across uh, uh, all the major antidepressants and, and did a big analysis. And um, they found some efficacy, but I, I want you to draw your attention. In fact, you can't quite read it here. The median duration of study uh, in this large analysis was eight weeks. These are drugs that we give for years and years and years. And it's, it's, a, it's a failing of us as scientists and clinicians that this is the quality of evidence. It's really, this is really low quality evidence. We don't know if these work in the way they're prescribed. The other um, problem with all the studies in this analysis is that 78% of, of them were funded by industry. And that isn't necessarily a bad thing, except that we know that when industry funds studies about drugs, industry get rather different results to when they're independently funded. And there's lots and lots of evidence about this. Um, this is one of the biggest analysis from the Cochrane Group, who are a very uh, 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 respected group of, of scientists. And our analysis suggests the existence of an industry bias that cannot be explained by standard risk of bias assessments. What they're saying is that even if you're an expert and you read a paper, you won't be able to figure out how, um, how the effect is being created. So industry-funded studies are problematic. The uh, main diagnostic screening questionnaire for depression used on the NHS website is called the PHQ-9. It was developed using funding from a drug company that at the time it was developed was producing one of the largest selling antidepressants in the world. It doesn't invalidate the PHQ-9, but it is, I would put to you, problematic when the people profiting from the disease are also um, helping to create the guidelines that will allow prescription and prompting prescription. So that's the, that's a, a sort of, a, and then there's lots more evidence, but that's the kind of framework I'm thinking of um, as I uh, go and meet Sarah and as I'm filming uh, the doctor who gave up drugs. So I, I wanted to uh, stop some antidepressants in someone who didn't want to take them and, and, and discuss this lack of evidence or the problems with the evidence. And uh, so we, we met Sarah who'd, who at 24 had been on antidepressants for eight years. Um, she had an eight-month-old. Uh, she'd been started initially on fluoxetine and then switched to citalopram. 
and she'd been, uh, she'd been started following two bereavements while she was a teenager. And it's not enough just to stop drugs and go, well, there you go, they don't work. All of us, whether you're a clinician or a patient, uh, uh, we all want to do something. And I didn't want to just do any old thing. Uh, I wanted to see if I could do something that was a bit scientific. So I called Mike Tipton um, and Heather Massey, who are old friends from the University of Portsmouth, two of the world's leading cold water physiology experts, and said, is there any science behind jumping in cold water? And they said, absolutely. There's a huge amount of anecdotal data from the very strange community of people who do it uh, uh, every single day, uh, so there may be some among you, uh, and they will report that it helps them with a huge variety of things. These, these people will say that it has helped them through bereavement, divorce, cancer, uh, pain. It helps them with almost every aspect of their lives. And then there is some really good science um, that is theoretical at the moment. But it works like this. If you repeatedly immerse yourself in cold water, you get used to it. So you build up a tolerance. And that gasp reflex, the high heart rate, that stress response becomes diminished. But the crucial thing that Heather and Mike discovered was that this cross adapts you to other stresses. So just as getting in cold water seems to reduce your stress response to getting in cold water, it also helps your stress response with other stresses. So they wondered, or we all wondered, if cold water repeated immersions might reduce the stress response to the stresses of daily life, that chronic stress that we think causes uh, the inflammation that leads to a huge number of diseases of modern life, including depression. The, the stresses being things like inactivity, poor diet, social inequality, social media, poor employment, political oppression, structural violence in the world around us. So that was the theoretical framework. We took Sarah swimming, and I would say this is one of the most joyful things I've ever done in my life. Joy is infectious, and Sarah got out of the water and said, um, with, uh, I think she put the caveat, apart from the, the birth of her daughter, this was the happiest she had felt um, uh, for years and years and years. And uh, there really wasn't a kind of dry eye, aside from the rain, everyone was, was sort of deeply moved. Who's to say exactly what it was that brought about the change in Sarah, but she kept cold water swimming and she stopped taking her antidepressants. Maybe it was the uh, sense of achievement. Perhaps if we'd stuck her on stage and she'd, she'd sung a song, she might have had the same set of positive emotions. Maybe it really was the cold water. Maybe it was the spirit of the amazing production crew that surrounded her. But we wrote her up as a case report and I communicate with her and her life is not Perfect, she would say, but she still swims and it helped her at a moment uh, of real crisis in her life. So, we wrote it up as a case report, which is really that first layer of evidence above the anecdote. It's a long way from proving anything. It's a long way from demonstrating anything convincingly. But I still cold water swim, and, and as I broadcast about subjects like this, there's, there's something I really love, particularly about this, this foot in the door of an explanation about depression. When you say that pills don't work, people with mental illness, and I include myself amongst those people, uh, often feel delegitimized. The pills have a heft and a scientific weight that makes them feel that it isn't their fault. And when you start saying, well, exercise helps, or cold water swimming helps, sometimes people feel uh, their, their concerns aren't legitimate, and you're really saying they're not well. Well, the biological explanation here, or the biological hypothesis, gives us something that's scientifically testable. And it opens the door to asking wider questions about how it is that our lives cause stress, inflammation, and possibly mental illness. And the thing I really like is it locates those problems outside our body and creates the possibility of solutions that may be much more about changing the environment we live in rather than uh, creating individual responsibility. So I'm not anti-pills. I wouldn't want anyone to stop any pills without discussing with their doctors. But what I would really love is if pills didn't suppress dialogue around other ways that we all might achieve joy and wellness. Thank you very much.